Well, praise the Lord, the Pentecostals of Fort Worth Church family. Here we are again in the ever-evolving opportunities of worship life. As you know, it is very cold outside, number one. Number two, it has been moist all day, and so the roads are becoming slick and, and out of utter and ultimate concern for your safety tonight and knowing, realizing how many would like to stay home in the warmth of your own home. Uh, we're going to go ahead and do something special tonight. We're going to do online only. And uh, again, I want you to stay home, stay safe. I apologize. Uh, not my desire to do this. But I have a special, a special message that I want to present to you. Uh, and it'll be in line with our series that I've been teaching about dreams, the call to leadership. And so just stay in that theme and we'll pick it up again. I just want you to know I love you. I'm praying for you. I believe in you. And we're going to see the greatest revival. I see a revival greater and I see a harvest greater than anything I've ever seen. It's coming. It's building right here at the Pentecostal of Fort Worth. And we're going to see it in Jesus' name. So receive this word tonight. Let it inspire you. Let it encourage you. Let it bless you. And if you need healing in your body, claim, lift your hands and call on the name of Jesus and be healed in Jesus' name. I love you. We're going to be in revival on Sunday with Evangelist Aaron Adams. We'll be back. It's going to be a great time. Please remember your tithe and offering because guess what? The bills are still due. Okay, I love you. You know I had to throw that in there. God bless you. Encourage somebody in the Lord today and invite somebody to church this weekend in Jesus' name. I hear it's going to be in the 60s on Sunday, so let's get out to church. God bless you. Genesis, the 39th chapter, verse 1. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, brought him, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph. He was a prosperous man. He was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. His master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him. And he made him overseer over his house and all that he had put into his hand came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field, and he left all that he had in Joseph's hands, and he knew not aught he had save the bread which he did eat, and Joseph was a goodly person and well-favored. Would you pray with me, Lord? Everyone, lift your voice. Let's pray together. Jesus, I thank you for this church. I thank you for this meeting. I thank you for this service. I thank you for your people who have come together today because we are hungry to hear your voice. Now, I ask you that you will help me to preach with power, with authority, revelation, and love. In the name of Jesus, let me speak the truth in love today that your people will be edified and that we will be better able to do the work to which you have called us in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. We're now almost two years into the global pandemic that seems to have derailed our plans for God's work, our plans for God's work, and left us frustrated and not quite sure what to do next. In the past two years, we've washed our hands, we've masked up, we've socially distanced, we've flattened the curve many times over, we've watched as the goalposts have been moved further and further through the end zone, and now it seems out of the stadium. We've been locked down, pushed back, beat up, and threatened with disastrous results if we don't comply with the latest mandate du jour. Depending on who you listen to, it's almost over or it's about to get a whole lot worse. Meanwhile, the church has tried to find a 
way to peacefully coexist with a world that does not like to retain God in their knowledge and has been given over to a reprobate mind to do things which are not convenient. And while I'm absolutely committed to following peace with all men, I am absolutely also devoted to following holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. say that the last two years have done a number on the church would be a serious understatement. I'm still quite bewildered by all that COVID-19 has done to us. When my dearest friend Eli Hernandez died May 8, 2020, it was obvious that being apostolic did not exempt us from the cruelty of this plague. We stood by in perplexity as this disease demanded that we abandon the scriptural principles that have served the apostolic church since the book of Acts. The word says, is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church. Pray, anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. But the COVID said, you can't go there and you certainly can't anoint them or touch them. The word said, forsake not the assembling of ourselves together, but... The COVID said, you must not assemble together with people of like precious faith. The Word said, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, of power, and a sound mind. But we've allowed the voices of fear, despair, and terror to have free access to our minds. And two years later in our church in Columbus, there are still people who are terrified of all the horrible things that will happen to them if they turn off the voices of fear and give ear to obey the word of the Lord. I refuse to live in the just-to-be-safe zone. We should have figured out early that this was a spiritually motivated attack when all of the required protocols demanded that we violate the principles of God's Word that have served the apostolic church uh, since the beginning. Not angry at anyone, not come to criticize or castigate anyone. I want to help you. In 2020, we all did. We each did what we felt was good and right for the circumstance in which we found ourselves. We made adjustments in our church in Columbus. We made adjustments in our district. We really tried to accommodate the demands of the system. While smaller crowds and fewer service opportunities were certainly not my preference, I tried to do what seemed best under the circumstances. As much as we wanted to return to the church as usual prior to COVID, it is obvious that what we were doing before COVID had not resulted in the global apostolic revival for which we have all been believing. Brother Haney, we have not subdued any nations yet, but we will. We will learn from our mistakes. In Jesus' name we will, and we will move forward to subdue kingdoms in the name of Jesus Christ. And I do still believe in a global harvest of billions, with a B, billions of souls. It has been my honor and privilege to see uh, hundreds of thousands of people filled with the Holy Ghost. And in one single service in Ethiopia in 2003, Brother Kleinitz and I saw 117,000 people filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But we still have a long ways to go. fact remains that if we are to find our way out of this maddening maze of restrictions and move into global apostolic revival, we must recognize that the Scripture holds the key to our dilemma. Although everything has changed for the world, nothing has changed for the church. This is the only manual. 
this is the only pattern. This is the only answer. This is the only key. If we can't stand on the word, we have no plates to go. Our answers are still found in the forever settled word of God. Global revival will not come because the apostolic church becomes universally accepted on the world stage or because we learn to better accommodate a worldly mindset. It will not come when we can figure out how to make our less message less offensive to carnal people or when we can manage to let go of the things that set us apart from this dying world. Our apostolic distinctives are not our problem. In fact, the global revival that is right now breaking out around the world will not operate on any platform or stage that is not built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone. We will either be apostolic in doctrine and operation or we will be swallowed up by the antichrist system that is already flexing its muscles globally. I have come to encourage you today to believe that the lessons we have been learning over the course of the past two years are preparing you for divine favor that God is about to release on his people to reap this final harvest before the rapture of the church. I will readily admit to you that I haven't enjoyed what the past two years have done to the church and to our ministries. I have been frustrated most of the time, angry some of the time, irritable a lot of the time. We lost a third of our congregation and we're still not yet back to full strength. From my vantage point in January 2020, things were going better than at any time in the 28 years I had been pastoring the church at that point. My successor had been elected in 2018, four, four years ago today. And uh, the church was following him. He was following Christ. By every statistical measure, we were doing better than ever before. And then March 2020 hit us. And I refused to believe that we couldn't just rebuke it and move on. I became irritated at people who wanted to hide out. There's not a, I don't have a good reverse gear. Um, That's gotten me in trouble sometimes, but uh, I rebuked it, and it seemed the more I rebuked, the stronger COVID became. I waxed powerfully apostolic, a la Brother Billy Cole, and nothing I tried seemed to work. As I look back, I can relate to Joseph of our Genesis text up to the point of his rendezvous with his brethren in the fields of Dothan. He had lived a charmed life. He was the favorite son of an old man who was at the same time the most despicable deceiver in the world and the most divinely favored man alive. Jacob's doting love for Joseph made the elder brothers hate him. As if the multicolored coat was not enough, Joseph's dreams of his brother's obeisance to him clinched the deal. Some of you in this house are highly favored of the Father. It is obvious as we watch you operate that you are gifted, anointed, beyond the norm. But I do have a little word for you today. When you go to family meetings, just wear your black suit. Leave your multicolored coat at home. It will only serve to... Encourage your carnal brethren to attack you more viciously. Only two dreams would have given the casual observer any hint that this firstborn son of Rachel would become the de facto arbiter of who lived and died at the hands of a future famine that would grip the world and cross international borders. Both of Joseph's dreams were offensive to those who were closest to him. 
The Holy Ghost has made me know that there are dreams in this room right now that have set you dreamers apart for divine destiny. Some of you are carrying a dream in your spirit that you have never had the courage to nurture, let alone embrace and celebrate. I'm preaching to some precious brothers and sisters who have a word from the Lord that you have never had the courage to share with anyone else. It seemed too grand, too big, too significant, and you'd be embarrassed for anyone to know what you're carrying in your vessel. You are pregnant with a promise that you think is beyond your potential, but I've come with a word from the Lord for you. If God could do it for Joseph, he will do it for you. I know how you feel. God spoke to me in November of 1985 that I would become the pastor of the church where I've been now for almost 30 years. And from uh, November of 85 to November of 1992, the church had three pastoral changes, uh, and I was not involved in any of them. And yet I had a word from the Lord. I know what it's like to carry an unfulfilled promise, but you cannot, you must not abandon it like an unwanted burden. You must nurture that dream, nurture that word, nurture that promise, because God will bring it to pass. Right now it may seem that your dreams have come to torment you. The reality in which you are now living must be enlarged if your dream is to have room to grow to its God-given fulfillment. Joseph went into captivity behind that Ishmaelite caravan carrying dreams that were too big to fit his circumstances, but he refused to allow his circumstance to define his dream or destroy his destiny. You must not allow your circumstances to destroy your dream. So my brother dreamer, you must first maintain your integrity no matter what comes against you. No matter what attempts to imprison your future. There's always a Potiphar's wife who desires to disqualify you before you come to your place of fulfillment. So maintain your, your, your integrity and hang on to your dream. Protect it. You all know the story. Purchased by Potiphar to be a servant, head of all Potiphar's household, Potiphar's licentious lying wife, Pharaoh's special prison where the king's captives were held, favor with the keeper of the prison in charge of everything in the prison, the butler's dream, the baker's dream. As Joseph watched the butler walk out with his promise, we hear his plaintive cry in 40 and 14 of Genesis, but think on me when it shall be well with thee. And show kindness, I pray thee, unto me, and make mention of me to Pharaoh, and bring me out of this house. For I was indeed stolen out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also I have done nothing that they should put me into the dungeon. This plaintive plea, remember me, Pharaoh's butler gives us an insight to his longing to rejoin normal society. Can I get a witness? To be released from unfair imprisonment. I can relate to his desire to return to normal. He has now been a slave or a prisoner for 13 years. During these 13 years, he's been carrying a promissory word in his spirit through circumstances that seem to defy the dreams that God has given him. Everything in Joseph's existence has conspired to assassinate the hope for the future and the faith in God's power to perform in his behalf. Does anybody here relate? You know, you can say amen, it won't slow me down. 
Most of us, if not all of us, have been living in a state of frustrated expectation for the past two years. I understand how Joseph must have felt as he watched the butler return to normal while he continued to languish in his prison house of frustration and disappointment. But what Joseph did not know was the fulfillment of his dream was so much closer than he could imagine. Thirteen years of maintaining integrity. Thirteen years of keeping a right spirit. Thirteen years of passing up opportunity after opportunity to become bitter at his brethren and his circumstances and the God who seemed oblivious to his pain. Thirteen years of embracing a dream that seemed to be only a dim memory. Thirteen years of fellowshipping the biggest one you've ever seen and if I could speak to Joseph today I would say hold on Joseph don't give up now you're closer to your answer than you have any idea and if you'd allow me to speak to you today my words are the same hold on brother hold on sister don't give up now you're closer to your answer than you have any idea What Joseph didn't know and what no one in similar circumstances can possibly know is that there is a purpose in your pain. There is divine destiny in your dilemma and your deliverance to God's perfect will is closer than it looks from where you stand now. He's the only one who stands at the beginning and declares the end of the matter. You just have to trust him. You just have to trust him. Joseph's 13 years of slavery and imprisonment was the academy that God used to prepare him for political power, economic ingenuity, and social administration in the government of Egypt. In a matter of a few hours, he went from being a prisoner to being the viceroy of all Egypt, answerable only to Pharaoh himself. Nothing in Joseph's life to the point of his kidnapping by his brothers and sailed to the Ishmaelite caravan had prepared him for the position of administrative power and authority to which divine favor was about to propel him. And it would all happen in Egypt. You will track Joseph's steps from the day the Ishmaelites delivered him to the market where Potiphar purchased him for domestic service. You would see God's hand of favor at work to prepare Joseph for the day he would stand before Pharaoh. In fact, we can back up to the day Jacob sent him to Shechem to check on his brothers and the flocks. God arranged that little journey that then when the other brethren conspired to kill him, God moved on Reuben, the unstable one, to say, wait, let's not kill him. Let's keep him alive. As cruel as Reuben's words were, they were used of God to protect the dream that he had placed in that young man. If God could reuse Reuben to keep Joseph alive, he can and will protect your future. He will protect your dream. He will protect his word. He will bring it to pass. I prophesy to you today, God has ordered your steps and your stops for his glory. He heard you when you told him you wanted him to use you. He was listening when you told him you were willing to do anything. He took you at your word. And now you must live out that work as he orders your steps for your future. It was divine favor that brought Joseph to the attention of Potiphar at that slave auction that day. It was divine destiny that moved. <clears throat> It was divine destiny that moved Potiphar's wife to cast her eyes upon him. And it was divine protection that kept Potiphar from killing Joseph. 
And I believe Potiphar knew his wife was a liar, but he still had to go through the motions of punitive anger at Joseph. Hence, he was delivered to the prison where the king's prisoners were kept. It was divine destiny that once again moved him to a place of trust and administrative authority over all the affairs of the prison. Now, I'm sure that Joseph thought he was waiting for God to open the prison doors and set him free. But if you'll read the book closely, Joseph was actually waiting for Pharaoh to dream a dream that troubled his spirit. Three days after Brother Haney invited me to this pulpit, God spoke to me in prayer and said, You think you're waiting for me to shut down COVID, but you're really waiting for Pharaoh to dream a dream. Somebody here needs to hear the word today. You think you're waiting for God to shut down the pandemic, but in really, in reality, there is a Pharaoh in your future. Think outside the box with me. There is someone of influence in your future. And when they dream a dream, God's going to put you before them. And God will give you the word to speak at the right time. There is someone in your future with, in, with influence that extends beyond your present influence. And God is going to give you influence over the influencers. I feel a spirit of prophecy on somebody today. God is about to give you influence over the influencers in our world. How else can we find our way out of this mess? God has to do it and he will. Something is going to so shake their world that they will need you and the anointing that God has invested in you. You've been praying for God to enlarge your borders, Jabez. He's about to answer your prayer, but you must be willing to submit to the process of time. The skills you have developed in the operation of the gifts of the Spirit will give you the, the direction that you need. You will have to access a flow of the Holy Ghost in every gift that you will need. I'm preaching to people today who are now in the crucible of God's ordained preparatory academy and it's grooming you for a position of leadership and influence far beyond anything you can imagine. <laughs> Brother Cole used to tell us God uses whom he chooses. You've heard that before. I would add, and he owes no one an explanation or an apology. There are no shortcuts to divine promotion. You only get out of your present by passing the test. And I've repeated some tests so often, everybody in the class knows me by name. But I made up my mind, I'm going to get through this. I'm going to pass this test. I refuse to come to this well again and again and again. God is going to bring me out. Just ask Daniel. It doesn't make any difference whether it's the Babylonians, the Medes, or the Persians. Those chosen by God will rise to the top regardless of the political party in office. This is not about politics. This is about God's eternal plan for you and your life and his church. You are chosen. So hear me, Esther. You have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And your influence is going to pull Mordecai and those close to you up through the ranks with you. Haman may look invincible, but I've got news for you. Haman will not survive this encounter. Remember, this was not just about Joseph's deliverance from prison. It was about preserving life. 
the lives of his father's house, the brethren who had so despitefully used him and hated him for his dreams. There's a famine coming, and God has positioned the answer before the world even knows there's a problem. So when the butler is restored to his place, it's so he'll be on location to recommend Joseph to Pharaoh. There are no minor encounters on your journey. Hear me today, my precious brothers and sisters. There are no minor encounters on your journey. He may have been just a butler, but your ministry to the butler will figure large in God's plan for your destiny in Pharaoh's court. Despise not the day of small things. And for a full two years, the butler forgot Joseph, and Joseph was left to wonder if he would ever see his dreams fulfilled until Pharaoh dreamed a dream. 41.14 of Genesis, then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him, get this next, hastily out of the dungeon. And he shaved himself and changed his raiment and came unto Pharaoh. He didn't have to pray through he didn't have to repent. He didn't have to get a fresh word from the Lord. He was operating on the last one he got. All he had to do was clean up because there's some things about prison that will not fit where you're about to go. And so God is going to remove the scars of your prison in his time. Thirteen years of unjust accusation, thirteen years of frustration, thirteen years of humiliation, thirteen years of being misunderstood, thirteen years of hopeless abandonment, thirteen years of wondering if this nightmare would ever end, and it all happened in a hastily out of the dungeon. God sent me here to encourage every incarcerated dreamer in this house. Don't allow yourself to become bitter. Your situation may be unexplainable and your humanity demands an answer, but do not become bitter. When Joseph's hastily moment came, he was a shave and a change of clothes away from divine destiny. I know it hasn't seemed fair and you're fed up with keeping a right spirit when you've been wounded in the house of your friends, but keep a right spirit anyhow. Job testified he couldn't find God, forward, backward, left, or right. He's not there, but just because Job lost track of God doesn't mean God lost track of Job. And I want you to know, it may feel to you like God's lost track of you because you have lost track of him, but he knows the way that I take. There's gold in your future. There's gold in your, in your future. In the name of Jesus, God is going to bring it to pass. Now, as soon as Joseph comes to destiny, the first thing he has to deal with is the coming famine. He immediately puts the le lessons learned in Potiphar's house and in the prison in place to organize and manage all of Egypt's uh, resources to prepare for the famine. He didn't get that at daddy's house. He got it after he was kidnapped, after he was sold, after he was imprisoned. And during his prison days, God gave him everything he was going to need to be able to administer the greatest uh, relocation in the history of the world. By the time it's all over, all of the private property in Egypt will be transferred to Pharaoh by Joseph's administrative skill. Joseph's brothers will bow before him just like the dream declared. Joseph's father and entire family will be relocated to Goshen where they will thrive and be blessed. And as much as Jacob and his sons resisted the famine, the famine was God's plan for the future of the children of Israel. 
And as much as I have resisted everything that's come in the last two years, I must conclude on the basis of God's Word that God has used this as an academy to prepare the church. We will be victorious. There will be revival. And yes, Brother Haiti, we will subdue kingdoms in Jesus' name. It will come to pass. None of us like change. I got an idea. Why couldn't God have just made it rain in Canaan? I mean, let all those sinful Egyptians go through the pain. I don't know why or how God's going to use COVID to prepare the apostolic church to reap the final earth's harvest. I've watched him do a few things. Most of them have been the things I see when I look in the mirror and when I listen to myself pray and I realize I'm not praying with near the frustration that I was two years ago. I'm not making demands. I'm just figuring out trying to figure out how I can get on board with what he's doing. As frustrating and challenging as COVID has been for us, this pandemic cannot destroy the church, nor can it destroy the harvest that God has given us to reap. We will have to become more comfortable with apostolic operation than we have ever been before. We will have to be willing to rely on angelic protection and provision as never before. If you have all the answers, then you don't need divine intervention. But the past two years have taught us that we don't have all the answers, but God does. Last night, one of the Bible school students came and asked me to tell her a story about divine protection in Pakistan. I just have one. In October, late October, I was scheduled to be in Pakistan for three conferences over a period of 10 days. I'd received my Pakistani visa, read all the requirements for entry on the Pakistani embassy website. I had the necessary negative PCR tests and a hard copy of all the entrance requirements from their website. I was traveling with a young seer, a prophet from our church, and uh, everything went well until we showed up to board our flight from Dubai to Islamabad. The gate agent scrutinized our documents and then asked for our certificates of full COVID vaccination. And I explained that we would not be needing that because the Pakistani embassy website had said nothing about needing to be fully vaccinated, as they say. And we were not fully vaccinated. We were not vaccinated at all. And the first agent looked at me as a kindergarten teacher would say to a little child who had just had an accident. But everyone should be fully vaccinated. I said, I'm sorry. I'm not. And at that moment, I was very sorry. <laughs> After about an hour and a half dealing with three different Emirates Airline officials who all really did try to help us. They wanted to help us. God gave us favor. And finally the man looked at me and he said, Mr. Stark, I need to cancel your reservation on this flight because the plane's going to leave without you. And we'd been traveling for about 32 hours. My brain was fried. And um, I looked at Russ. I said, Let's get a hotel and see if it seems any better in the morning. Um, 
The gate agent supervisor, supervisor filed an application for an exemption of uh, vaccination on our behalf, and immediately the answer came back from Islamabad, no. And so he gave me all the paperwork. He said, file this again tomorrow morning. Finally, we found a hotel that had rooms, and we got in, and um, next morning I got up, that was Friday, I filed the application, but that was the holy day, and so they didn't read it till Friday night. And within seven minutes of opening my email, I received a very curt email back, no exemption will be granted. And uh, we had had a prayer meeting in my room, and um, it felt good. But no exemption will be granted. And uh, so uh, we went through Friday, and Saturday morning we got up to have another prayer meeting, and by this time I was pretty much resigned. Aside from a miracle, I'm going back home without ever unpacking my suitcase. And um, I'll report to the pastor that all that money we spent on those tickets was wasted. And uh, so we got together for prayer again, and we prayed for a little while. It was nothing intense. And... Uh, no commands, no shouts, no calling for. I just finally said, Lord, would you just send an angel to negotiate in our behalf? And when I said that, as soon as I finished, Russ said, oh, sir, I forgot to tell you. There was an angel showed up in my room this morning. Now, Russ sees angels regularly. I sense them, and God has given him to me so I will know what they look like. And uh, I said, uh, well, that would have been nice to know. He said, the angel just showed up, walked through my room as if to report for duty and let me know he was available if we needed him. I said, well, I just sent word to the Lord that we need him. He said, yes, and when you said that, the first angel just walked through here, and he had a second angel with him. He said the second angel was very, very brilliantly lit, and he was very powerful, and he just went out through that wall. He is on his way to Pakistan to negotiate the terms of our arrival. As we were talking about the angels, my phone rang. It was Bishop Khalid in Islamabad. He said, if you will open your email, there are two applications for exemption certificates in your email. As soon as you and Russ sign them and return them, your certificates of exemption will be granted and you are free to come to Pakistan. And if on, as if on cue, my email went ding. And I opened it, and there they were. And all I had to do was sign my name on that little pad thing. And Russ signed his name. We sent them back. And within two hours, we had certificates of exemption that were good for travel to Pakistan for as long as we needed to be there. It took us a couple of three days to be able to get seats on a plane, and they offered me 
business class seats at an exorbitant price, and I should have bought them, but I stayed there, spent the same money staying in the hotel and <laughs> eating in the restaurant and all that stuff. But anyway, so by Saturday night, I'm feeling pretty good. And I got a third email from the same aeronautic official who had sent me the one Friday evening that said no exemption will be granted. Now I have two certificates of exemption and he sent a third, same guy who had said no, none will be granted, sent a third letter. It was addressed to all aeronautical officials in Islamabad, Karachi, and Lahore. Preference will be given for James Stark and Russ Underhill, and they are welcome with no, with no certificate of vaccination required, signed by the same guy who said none will be granted. And the words came to my mind, thus shall it be done for the man who the king delighteth to honor. Now before COVID, Brother Kleindienst, we dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's. And after COVID, we thought we did. But when we had messed up on one thing, we didn't know something we needed. God sent an angel and he opened the door and he let us in. You got to become comfortable with this. In our abbreviated time in Pakistan, God allowed us to uh, graduate about uh, 35 or 38 people from Bible school. We saw some new ministers licensed. And uh, they arranged a little crusade for us in Karachi. Now, 20 years ago, Brother Hernandez, Brother Hernandez and I were in Karachi. And uh, in three days, we saw 2,500 people receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, saw a lot of miracles. And then it seemed like all hell broke loose. And we fought devils in Pakistan until about three years ago. But we had never been able to go back and have any kind of a major meeting. And this one was not major. When I got up, they told me there were 2,000 people there. But that was a nice thought. <laughs> Probably by the time I gave the altar call, there were 1,500. And God filled 150 people with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, speaking with other tongues for the first time in a, in a meeting like that. You've got to understand something. You've got to hold of something bigger than you have any idea even exists. Now, I didn't plan on needing angelic intervention to get into Pakistan, but when we needed it, it was so nice to know that angels still work in behalf of the sons of God. So where are you, my brother dreamer? If the angel of the Lord could bring Simon Peter out of Herod's prison, he will do the same for you. If the Spirit of the Lord could catch away Philip from the Ethiopian eunuch's baptism in the desert and drop him in Azotus, I fully believe that we will see similar demonstrations of apostolic power in our day. If God could send an earthquake to open the prison in Philippi, he could likewise shake the prison where your dream is incarcerated. If aprons, prayer cloths, and handkerchiefs worked in the apostles' day, I believe they will work for apostolic believers today. 1911, there were special miracles wrought when they received bits of cloth. 
from the apostles. And so, Pastor, I challenge you today, go home, make some prayer cloths, and you can do it whenever you're ready to see the miracles start. Put them out in front of the church, start anointing them, get people to come down and lay hands on them, and then send them home with your people. For the Bible says, these signs shall follow them that believe. You don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to have a card. You must be a believer. In my name, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And so on Saturday morning in Karachi, they told me they wanted me to talk to a group of Bible school students. There were about 150, 180 of them in this hot little room. And I got to talking about what God could do. And I said, uh, I sense that there are people here who need God to touch your body. And uh, if you have pain, sickness, disease, infirmity, stand to your feet. And uh, to my surprise, about two-thirds of the people stood up. And uh, there was a man there. He's one of our pastors. I noticed a lump on the side of his jaw. And um, we got to, I I said, no, I'm not going to lay hands on you. The Bible says these signs shall follow them to believe. And so I want you to find a believer. And I'll give you instructions, and you pray the way I instruct you, and God is going to work through you. And um, so a young lady came up, and she pointed to this man with the little lump on his jaw. She said, very, very broken English. He was fluent in Urdu, of course, and I know no Urdu. And so um, she let me know that was her dad and that that was cancer. And she wanted me to come pray. I said, no, you're going to pray, and God's going to work the miracle through your hands. So finally I convinced her that I was not going to come and pray for her father, but she was, and my prayers were not the ones that mattered. It was the answer that was going to come in the name of Jesus. And uh, so she went back, and I instructed her to put her hand on that place on her dad's jaw and she began to pray and it didn't appear to me that anything happened. I mean, I was, I could hardly wait for her to move her hand so I could see that knot was gone and she finally moved her hand and the knot was still there and I went on and prayed for some other people and about 10 minutes later this man came up and asked Bishop Collett if he could testify and so Bishop gave him the microphone and he began to testify and the people went just crazy and I thought wow still got the knot there I'm not sure what's going on here all of a sudden he dropped the mic to his side and he began to scream hallelujah hallelujah and the place absolutely came apart what I did not know is that for weeks uh, that cancer that was manifest here had also stripped his vocal cords uh, of the ability to make any sound Uh, and in that moment God completely restored uh, his voice uh, and he was preaching the gospel the next morning in his church Uh, I want you to understand something we have a hold of everything we need to subdue kingdoms years ago, we bought a commercial property, and uh, we occupy about a third of that with our church, and the rest of it is rented out, and we have a property manager who has been a friend to us. He happens to be Jewish, and um, we kind of walk delicately around each other for the first several years, but we've become very good friends. 
he showed up in my office one day, and I could tell he was agitated. I said, sit down, Will, what's the problem? He said, you know more about this than I do. But he said, I've got a friend. He said he's got cancer throughout all his body, and they've only given him a few months to live. And he said, I know you believe in prayer, and you know how to pray. Would you pray for my friend? I said, I'll do you one better, Will. I said, we're going to anoint a prayer cloth, and you take it to your friend, and you put it on him in the name of Jesus. He looked at me. He, I said, will you do that? He said, I will. We anointed the prayer cloth. And about three weeks later, he came back to the office. And he's crying. He said he went to the doctor and the cancer is gone from his body. You're not alone. You're not in your prison alone. My God is preparing you to set you before Pharaoh to influence the influencers. If, you could, if God could bring Joseph before Pharaoh and Paul before Felix, Festus, and Agrippa, why not bring you before the mayor, before the governor, somebody else, some other person of influence? A few years ago, Brother Charles Robinette prayed a senator and his wife through to the Holy Ghost before the service ever started in one of our churches here in the U.S., I've seen blind eyes open. I've seen deaf ears unstopped. I've seen cancer healed, including a tumor the size of a basketball that shrunk to nothing in less than 60 seconds. Brother Kleinitz and I both have a piece of rope from Ethiopia when they brought a demoniac and he had, been, uh, in, he had been tied up with a piece of uh, wood behind his arms. Uh, his, uh, his, this bone here in, his, in both shoulders came down, went like this and down to the elbow. And they brought him up and we began to pray for him, casting out the devil. And we, Brother Kleinus reached down and started un un untying that rope. Uh, we took the rope off of the young man. He stood to his feet and God filled him with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We have what we need. So where are you, brother dreamer? Do you have a promise? Do you have a dream? Do you have a word from the Lord? Are you willing to step out and embrace it here and now? Maybe you've despised it before, but you can safely claim it here today. The first two chapters of Matthew, God intervened five times in dreams to protect and preserve the life of the Christ child, so don't ignore your dreams. It was a vision that signaled the apostle Peter that the trip to Cornelius' house was God's will and would open a new door of faith to a new group of people. And as if that were not enough, the Spirit said, go with the men. Simon Peter perceived that God is no respecter of persons. That's apostolic. God used a prophet, Agabus, to prophesy Paul's coming incarceration. When Paul was in the storm on his journey to Rome, it was the angel of the Lord that appeared to him and told him, be of good cheer because you and the 276 passengers on the ship are all going to survive. It was the Holy Ghost that said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. So speak your prophecy. In the apostolic church, if you make a mistake, the others will judge and will correct it. Hold on to your word. Hold on to your word. We've made some mistakes in the past, but the Bible says I will restore the years the canker worm, the locust, the caterpillar have taken. Yeah. 